wonderful thing. We will be playing some clips from the documentary as the conversation goes, but I would certainly encourage you to go see the whole thing if you can, um, because it really is, um, I don't know how to say it. it, it sort of takes you through a history lesson, but it also personifies um, a person. And so um, it's a really uh, interesting way to see that time period of history. And um, the one shout out I'll give, we were just talking about this upstairs, is there's a clip of Hillary Clinton, which is pretty amazing. And um, it's a Hillary you don't see on the campaign trail, so <laughs> it's worth also seeing it for that. Um, so I'm gonna let the conversation start, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, thanks for being here. And, uh, and your mom, uh, Liddy Holbrook, uh, where are you sitting? There you are, is here joining us as well, which is a real honor to have both of you on campus. Well, it's a nostalgia tour. We lived here when I was four. Okay, right. Right, so we went down, turned Coming out the back houses. To the roots. Yeah, the houses that we lived in are demolished for much more improved housing, so <laughs> congratulations, Princeton. So I met, I met your father uh, so years ago. I was having lunch in New York um, with Ariana Huffington. And I'll never forget, it was at this restaurant with all these reporters, and he walked in and he walked to the table to say hello. And you felt like you were in the presence of someone very significant and, uh, and, and very smart. And he had that aura, and I just kind of remember that, and you really capture that in the film. <laughs> Um, but it's just a moment that stuck with me, which is, I assume, what many people have when and, they met him. And did Ariana say anything about my father that's interesting they, after they left? No, just no, curious. no, 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 just, we moved on. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but it, it, was, it was wonderful to meet him. How did you decide to make a film about your father? Well, he was such a great subject, and, and I'm a filmmaker. That's what I do, and that's the world I live in, is documentaries. And when he died uh, that night, we went back to his house in Georgetown, some wine and, and family and a couple of friends, including Samantha Power, the current ambassador of the UN, and she said, David, you have to make a film about him. And I said, Samantha, he's not 90 minutes dead, and, and please. And then, you know, I just kind of left it and, and dealt with my intense grief for, but then, and as I say in the film, then in about a month later, there was a memorial for him at the Kennedy Center, and President Obama was there, President Clinton, Hillary Clinton, all these luminaries, and I say, as I say to Hillary in the film, I sat on stage with her and all these people and realized he was an historical figure in a way I hadn't really thought through. I mean, of course, I knew he had had an impact. I'd read what he had done. I'd read his books. I followed all of that, but I didn't think of him that way. I thought of him as my father, and when I thought about that, I thought, okay, here's a really interesting film to make. And, and there was another factor in which I don't get into the film is the night before, a bunch of his team from Afghanistan all assembled at somebody's house the, the night before that m memorial and all assembled to tell stories about him. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, him forgetting his keys and missing a plane and the kind of chaos, but also the affection and, the in and not the intimacy, but the, the tightness of this relationship of people he spent time with. And that, you know, as you find out in the film, was it my brother or me? And so I wanted to know that person. And so I said, often I think the really other big factor in this for me at the time was as a filmmaker, I didn't want to sit in an audience and watch a film about him made by somebody else that didn't ring true to me. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to do what I said was my story of his life. And here we are. <laughs> and the film, I mean, it's, it begins, I mean, chronologically with his experience in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and the way that influences him, his approach to diplomacy. Could you talk a little bit about what you learned? I learned so much about that. And, and you know, it's an amazing thing. He lands in Vietnam in May of 1963. And, you know, people always say, oh, he worked for, you know, Clinton and Obama and Carter, but he also worked for Johnson, really did work for him in the White House. But ostensibly, he was a junior foreign service officer, and his ultimate boss was President Kennedy. You know, so that's what's happening in Vietnam. And as my mother says in the film, you have to understand, you know, Vietnam was very different. The beginning of the war was very different from the end of it. So he lands and he's seen things that he knows are true because he's seen them. And he's realizing that these things are not corresponding with the way Washington's seen things. And in a letter to my mother again, he writes and said, you know, I don't understand how people 12,000 miles away from what's happening on the ground can be making decisions that are so out of touch with reality. Another scene in the film is George Packer talks about how he was watching Robert McNamara, 
you know, the legendary Secretary of Defense coming to Vietnam, and as he said, not only knowing, not even knowing what questions to ask, he was so out of touch with the realities on the ground. And I think for him, his big takeaway from that period was he went into the war, working for the war believing in its efforts. He thought it was poorly executed. He thought there were a lot of things that went wrong. But I think the, the lifelong lesson for him as a diplomat was you have to see things with your own eyes. You have to be there on the ground and understand what's happening by talking to everybody, not just the generals, not just the ambassadors, but the fruit sellers and the refugees and the farmers. And, and that was really informative to him throughout in Bosnia and Afghanistan. And that was a theme that comes back later when you move to Bosnia, which is another, this is a great film beyond the person on American history. I mean, and foreign policy, you get this great trajectory all through Afghanistan, from Vietnam to Afghanistan. But one of the things when you're talking in Bosnia was this belief uh, that you had to see things. Um, and he always wanted to go to the site of conflict before trying to figure out a resolution. Well, it was part of his nature. Is he wasn't afraid, and he wanted to really see it, to smell it, to taste it. He loved markets. You know, wherever I was with him traveling somewhere, he wanted to go to a market and walk through and try the crazy fruit he's never seen. Or, and, and I think that interaction for him was both, you know, uh, intense tourist and, and this incredible curiosity he had. But if it was a conflict region, he had to understand that. And, and you know, I found journals of his where he went to Tibet in like 1990. And you know, Tibet's still new. And yes, he wanted to see the Zhou Kong and the Patala Palace. But he also was in prisons interviewing Tibetan prisoners. You know, he wanted to really talk to them and see their conditions and get to them firsthand. And, and I think that ran throughout his career. And it became much more complicated later, which we can get into, because, but the, that idea of being there when he was 14. <laughs> <laughs> and he did this. He said, some people write their memoirs after they're famous. I'm going to write mine before <laughs> I'm famous. And so he saw himself, despite the joking nature of that, I think as an historical figure early on, destined for something big. And, I, and maybe my mother, who saw him at that period, might agree or disagree. But that's how I see his you know, setting himself up for posterity in a way. And, and the letters with my mother were very clear. They were very elaborate, very detailed, incredible reportage of, you know, it, it's a journalist instinct. And he had wanted to be a journalist. He wanted to be an editor of the New York Times. They didn't offer him a job, so he went to the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. um, and so he ends up writing these things that give you a real flavor of what's happening. And he said to her, Instead of, keeping a di instead of keeping a journal, I'm going to write you these letters, and let's keep them, and then we'll you know, use them as notes for his memoir. And, and that's exactly what his plan was. And, and he did that, though, throughout. And, and the third act of the film in Afghanistan, he was keeping audio tapes, which we reveal, which I think you'll run a clip of. But that was, again, for him to have the, clear n the clarity for to be able to write a memoir. And just, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing, but he, he had been talking to his literary agent before he left, when he was planning to leave the Obama administration at some point. And he had plans for memoir, but it was going to be two volumes, like, like Churchill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so let me show this clip where he's talking about the relationship between the use of force and diplomacy as it related to Bosnia, I believe. And I'll just show this little clip, and maybe we could talk about it. In Bosnia, confronted by a small group of Bosnian Serbs, not all the Serbs, but a small group of Bosnian Serbs who were evil people, genuinely evil, confronting true evil, you had to be able to stand up to it. The phrase was diplomacy backed by force. I can remember lots of calls from Dick saying, we have to refine the exact terms those sons of bitches need to sign up to, or we're going to whack him. Richard understood the only thing that was going to change the absence of a balance of power on the ground was military force. But he couldn't snap his fingers and send the Air Force in. If use of force was inevitable, the Serbs were the perfect adversaries. So can you talk uh, about, that struck me when I first saw the film. and. Um, you know, these are two aspects of foreign policy that are usually separated. 
uh, but here through him, you really show how they he wove them together. So yeah, to look, I, I love that clip, and I and I think that phrase that Strobe Talbot says is really one of the key ones in the film, which is the mantra was diplomacy backed by force. There it is, you know, and, and to me. The, the film, if you look at it on a geopolitical, and, and we talked about this, I think, at some point, which was that, you know, to me, the geopolitical theme of the question of the film is who should be making American foreign policy, the diplomats or the generals? And that runs through in Vietnam, certainly, this question of which should be priority in Bosnia, as Strobe Talbot clearly says, diplomacy backed by force. And in Afghanistan, it was the day of the generals. And, and I think that was something my father saw very frustratingly happen as a trend that dissolution of power of, of on the State Department side. And even if you look into the Obama administration, their foreign policy, at least on Afghanistan, which I knew the most about, you know, the national security advisor is General Jim Jones. The ambassador to Afghanistan at the time is General Carl, Carl Eikenberry. The, the um, special assistant to Afghanistan and Pakistan in the White House. My father was special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan in the State Department, but the special assistant was General Doug Lute. And so you had these you know, generals in civilian roles, and my father had an enormous respect for the military. He really did, but he also felt that here the decision making was coming from a military perspective and really flavored Obama's first years in office on, on Afghanistan. But, but that's the moment, you know, the idea of, okay, we're going to have diplomacy here, and we're going to be talking to Slobodan Milosevic. But there are real questions. My father talks about it in his book, Can to War, that, you know, can we negotiate while we bomb you? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Nixon dealt with the same question. Right. You know, it's, it's something that come up. And, and my father's sense was, yeah, if, if, if your people are continuing to terrorize Sarajevo and fruit sellers by killing 78 people, yeah, we're going to talk and we're going to bomb you because that's, and, and I think with the Serbs in particular, that tough guy approach worked, you know. How did he think about, he, call, he uses the word evil, and I think that comes up in the film again. Yeah. I mean, how did he think of trying to negotiate with someone, in that case, who he, he understood not to be a good person? I, well, he, he, you know, he said, Sam Donaldson asked him at one point, it was a nightline, he said, do you trust Milosevic? And my father says, my job isn't to trust, but to negotiate. And then Hillary Clinton says later, we always said, you don't make peace with your friends. You know, you have to start out from this place. And, and for him, that was, you know, he relished it. And he loved the idea, I think, of, of you know, it was really him and Milosevic. And we realized that, you know, it just kept coming back to these two guys. And there's this incredible scene that Chris Hill talks about where Milosevic looks at my father. Milosevic at this point wants more than any of the three presidents in the Dayton negotiations, more than the Bosnians, more than Croatians, he wants this war to end because he's lost ground, he lost the momentum militarily, he's invested in this peace process now and he feels it needs to go through. And so he says to my father in this incredible bit of negotiations, he says, Richard, Charles, Albert, Holbrook, he said, the question is, do you have the balls to finish this? And, and I, you know, thing to say to somebody else, I can't imagine yeah. being said, that being said to me, plus by you know, the strong man of Europe who was responsible. But, but I think he really relished that. I think he liked that. And, and as President Clinton said, you know, he, he said, oh, Milosevic had the coldest eyes I've ever seen. And I'm really glad that Holbrook was there to, take, to deal with him. Yeah, and, and so it, it took a lot of gamesmanship and, you know, it was chess mixed with professional wrestling, you know. Right. But he was good at that. He had that high-low, that ability, the strategic part, and then also you know, the public diplomacy part of how to play this out in the press, how to deal with this on so many other levels. It, um, I mean, that, that's clear. And we're going to show a clip of the whole date negotiations, which is kind of amazing to watch. Um, but he, he did have a good sense of state, the... the staging aspect of diplomacy and you even talk in New York at the UN you'd have these dinners and think about where everyone should sit um, how, how did he learn to do that how did he I, make I, that part of his diplomatic approach I think it was really from going to see shows on Broadway <laughs> uh, I mean I think he had this sense for the theatrical he loved theater he kept all his playbills 
he loved theater. I mean, and, and I joke, but it's true. And I think that, he, you know, John Guare, the playwright, is a good friend of his. He was always around. He, he liked the idea of the dramatic. And, and so for him, just placing in Dayton, you know, the first question is, how, where do you set your play? You know, and he was going to set this in Dayton, Ohio, knowing full well that Dayton was going to provide him a couple of things. One, <coughs> Slobodan Milosevic had been an investment banker in New York, was so psyched to get back to New York, and he was going to be seeing Broadway shows, and he was going to be negotiating this while he was a man about town and showing up in page six. And instead, he's sent to this, to Dayton, Ohio, and no offense against Dayton, but it, it's... <laughs> We'll just leave it at that. Uh, and, uh, but it was also the idea of an Air Force base, because then he could control the perimeter and the press. And he knew that if these guys were going to leave the base, he was going to know about it. He also knew there wasn't many places to go. And basically, Milosevic's other real need to end this was he was bored out of his mind. He hated being Dayton. And he wanted, you know, like his only friend was a cocktail waitress at Packy's Sports Bar named Vicky, who he called Wiki. Uh, and that was it. And so for him, he knew all that. And, and the other thing my father did, which didn't work so well, it's like probably Dayton was 20 days, day 16 or 17, and they'd given everybody an ultimatum and said, if this isn't done by whatever hour, we're out of here. The Americans are done. We're walking out. And so he told all his staff to pack their bags and to bring them to the front desk of the hotel to show this and it was just theater to show these, and, and the negotiators saw right through it. They're like, Come, stop, stop this silliness. And I think some of his staff just brought out empty suitcases because they didn't want to go to the effort of packing up their room. And, and they knew it was just a, it was a gambit that had little teeth. And, but it was, again, the theater of it and, and understanding all of that. So let's show uh, the next clip, which is about 10 minutes to give you a sense of Dayton. If Dayton and the peace process do not succeed, the country will slip back into war. There was tremendous pressure on him. He was in the hot seat. There was no daylight between him and what he was trying to accomplish. The most bitter of enemies will sit down with negotiators to try to bury their differences as they have their dead. I think by then your dad had traction, and that's a fearsome sight. Holbrook was traction. Did you think going into Dayton that it was going to work? Not really. The setting of this dinner was so spectacular, it certainly demonstrated that the US was not a country to be trifled with. Typical of Richard, it was a piece of theater. He told me very directly, Kati, you have to make Milosevic and Izbegovic talk to each other. This was my first diplomatic assignment from my new husband. But much of the evening, they were each looking in a different direction. Toward the end of the dinner, as a desperate woman, I said, how did this war start? And Milosevic said, hmm, I didn't expect it to be so long. And at that point, Izbegovic piped in with, me neither. And then they started talking. By the end of dessert, they were calling each other Slobodan and Alia. Milosevic and the Serbs had been the aggressors throughout the war. Yet Alia Izbegovic, the founder and president of Bosnia, had made recent gains on the battlefield and was deeply conflicted about making peace. I was a brsta of his own secretary. I was working What is your sense of how your father felt about my father? He was a very strong method of making good decisions. I understood that. I understood that. I understood that. Day three, Friday, November 3rd. A new problem arose. An intrepid young Christian Science Monitor journalist, David Rode, had set out for Srebrenica, hoping to write a follow-up account of its fall. Srebrenica had kind of fallen off the map, and I was specifically frustrated, to be honest, with your father, because he stopped talking about this atrocity, which I thought was even bigger than I had reported. 
On October 29th, showing more courage than wisdom, he began digging near the presumed site of a mass grave. I had been in once, found them, gotten out, and reported the story, and I decided to go in a second time. Big mistake. Not surprisingly, he was picked up by Bosnian Serb police. As Dayton opened, he was missing. I gave the Serbs a bargaining chip because they had me, and they accused me of being a spy, and they insisted they weren't going to let me go. I told Milosevic that while we would continue to discuss the issues, no agreement would be possible at Dayton unless Road was found unharmed. To my amazement and embarrassment, he told Milosevic he was going to stop the talks, that he personally was responsible for the safety of David Road. Milosevic was astonished. You would do all this for a journalist? The correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor was greeted warmly by diplomats. It worked. I'm, I'm here today because of your dad. Saturday, November 18th, 1995. Negotiations have a certain pathology, a kind of life cycle almost like living organisms. At a certain point, which one might not recognize until later, the focus and momentum needed to get an agreement can disappear. Something can happen to break our single-minded commitment. We worried that if we were still at Wright-Patterson over the Thanksgiving holiday, only a few days away, it would create the impression we had stayed too long and accomplished too little. I remember at one point, Milosevic was worried whether Dick, you know, had the right fortitude. And he came up to him, and in this heavily accented English, he said, question is, Richard Charles Albert Holbrook, do you have balls to finish this deal? He said that to my father. Yes. And I was standing there, and I, I looked over at Dick. And Dick didn't answer, but boy, did he take it on board. After 20 days, the talks were faltering. The obstacle to an agreement was Izabegovic and the Bosnians, who remained reluctant to make peace. Your dad, thinking that we needed a visual to convince Izabegovic, created this sort of poster-sized board on all the gains that the Bosniaks had gotten. Izabegovic kind of shrugged, and the thing gets left on the side of a, a couch. But apparently, it was left in such a way that any visitor coming next could see what it was on the side of the couch there. Milosevic, it turned out to be the next visitor to see Izabegovic, he happened to look over there, and he said, wait a minute. Milosevic saw the poster and was furious. 55% of the land was being given to Bosnia and Croatia which violated a key principle of the talks. The split was supposed to be 51-49. The map had to be redrawn. Chris Hill and your father were running back and forth in these negotiations. People would run up and down the hall saying, he's just agreed. No, he said he's not agreeing. And then we had the Croats. Keeping them on board was important. At 4 o'clock a.m., Chris Hill told me that your father and the secretary are waiting on me in American pavilion. I came to American pavilion. And your father had in a hand champagne. And told me we finished negotiations. I told him, Richard, I want to see the map. The map was terrible. The problem was as the Bosnians fixed the map, they gave historic Croatian land to the Serbs rather than their own land, and that was never going to fly. I refused. I refused. Finally, tonight, the U.S. negotiators gave all of the parties that deadline. Finish this tonight or else pack up and go home. Tuchman insisted that Izabegovic put some land on the table, too, and Izabegovic would not accept the deal. Sometimes Izabegovic seems to want revenge more than peace, but he can't have both. 
the Serbs committed terrible crimes and they were going to be rewarded for it. The absence of justice, that kills you, really. The Bosnian peace talks in Ohio collapsed overnight. Three weeks after their first handshakes, the bitter enemies were locked in nonstop arguments. The United States has already told the Balkan delegations the talks will end in a few hours. Time had run out. We had to see Izabegovic. There were 700 journalists waiting outside the base, I said, and we needed an answer immediately. Izabegovic was a man under pressure. He was carrying alone the weight for the survival of his people and his nation. There was a long, agonizing pause. We watched Izabegovic carefully. No one spoke. Finally, speaking slowly, Izabegovic said, it is not a just peace, but my people need peace. da nije bilo tvrdoće, ali je Izetbegovića, mi bismo dobili još manje u tim pregovorima. Da nije bilo Alije Izetbegovića i njegove tvrdoće i hrabrost, vjerovatno ne bi bilo ove zemlje. S druge strane, ne bi bilo mira da nije bilo Richarda Hoboga. Rat Bosne i Hercegovine, ovi pesmi mrtvi svakog mjeseca i ranjeni bi se nastavio. I ko zna kako bi se to sve završilo. People who doubted American leadership, they saw it once again in Dayton. To people who doubted the American commitment to human rights, they saw it in Dayton. And I'm personally very proud to have been part of it. I remember the first time I came back here after Dayton, the first US troops were arriving. And I got in my Jeep and I drove out of this city I loved and hated. <laughs> And I just drove straight out of town, past the airport. People were clearing away roadblocks, and I couldn't believe it. It's a tough peace, but it's a peace. Four years of hellish war. The three presidents agreed to an astonishingly comprehensive plan. It's a hell of a job. I think people ought to take a moment and say, this is something really historic. Mission oh, Impossible okay. cartoon. Uh, How much of something like that was improvised? Uh, well, first of all, let me apologize on the subtitles. We've had a snafu with our educational distributor, but I did a really poor job on uh, <laughs> Serbo Croatian. But I, I think a lot of it was. And I, and I think, you know, certain diplomatic negotiations like Reykjavik with Reagan Gorbachev are orchestrated well in advance. And it's yeah. really just tying it up in a bow when you get there. Lots of real legwork has gone on beforehand, but with this, it was a high wire act. And I really think, you know, this is live reporting as best they could from outside saying, here it is day 20 and this thing's gonna collapse. And, and the pressure on Izabegovic, you know, I think all of that's real, but it was, uh, Wes Clark has a line in there, which I love. He goes, people are running this way and that, and your father's get that person. And, and the flow of it was madness, but, but he, it was what he was great at, you know, as, one of his friends described him as an Olympian of chaos. <laughs> and, and there's something true to that, just in this sort of general chaotic life he had. But, but this, I think he thrived off that and really understood how to channel that into a, into a peace treaty. But it, it was, you know, th there's a, a key clip where somebody asks him sort of glibly to explain the art of negotiation in 25 words or less. And he basically says, it's understand what the other ones want what you need and how to get there. And, and that's what he was doing the whole time. But, but there were, had to be a huge amount of, of improvisation. And, and to the Clinton administration's credit, they gave him a really long leash. You know, he didn't have to be checking in with Washington every time he was making a decision. He was able to, and, and Clinton believed in him. I don't think Warren Christopher particularly did, but he also knew that Clinton did. And he also knew that this was the best shot to end this atrocity that had been happening in Europe and the closest that they were going to get. But it, it was tricky, and I think that, you know, that poster story slays me because here they are, you know, and it's just sort of inadvertent. And Milosevic, you can see it, it plays like a movie scene, it picks it up, what the hell, this is outrageous. And then three in the morning, Mate Granic, the Croatian, comes in and they have champagne. You know, it's all plays out in these things and, and 
And you can see in my father the picture of the champagne. You can see in his eyes that he's not really buying it. He knows that there's still a couple of hurdles away from it. But, but he got there, and, and I think you know, that's a real testament to him, to the team, to everybody who, who did that. And, and one of the things I really learned in the making of this film, even reading his book and knowing more than the average bear about this, was how bloody hard this is to do and, and the number of levels. And if you think about it, in 1995, that was the summer before, or November of 1995. That's a year before the re-election for Clinton. Mm -hmm. And his people didn't necessarily like the, especially his political people, like the idea of sending American troops to a region where we don't even understand who the good guys are. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so, you guys remember what it was like, I mean, who is who and these names and why are we sending troops there? And there was this other thing, which my father called Vietnamalia syndrome, which was the, still the hangover from Vietnam, but also uh, the Mogadishu Black Hawk down, our troops being dragged through the streets of that. And, Wait, we're gonna. S the political advisors like, wait, we're gonna send the year before an election year American troops to a place we don't understand. But Clinton knew he was all in at that point, and and history's judged them right on this. There's amazing right. scenes before this where he's in Bosnia, and you just see the physical toll that negotiations took on him. I mean, he was relentless. Yeah, it was exhausting. I mean, he invented this thing. I think, yeah, it may have been done, but this idea of shuttle diplomacy. You know, Belgrade in the morning, Zagreb, uh, you know, and, and he was moving like that, and, and it was incredibly fluid. And, and, I, and I, it's funny to think about, but I bet he was never happier, mm -hmm. you know, to be in the midst of this and to have all this chaos around him, but all this focus towards this thing and towards this objective to him, which was paramount and should be. You know, the stakes were so high. You know, and I think, you know, go back to Broadway, I, I never worked on a show, but I know in making a film, there's this drive towards the end where things get a little frenetic and just put the stakes at, you know, a million times higher than right. putting on a play or making a movie. And, and that's what it was like for him. And I, and I, you know, and I really do think he enjoyed that part of it. Mm -hmm. So then the movie moves a little on the UN and Wall Street and right, and then you're uh, in the Obama period in Afghanistan, which is a, last part, um, really, of the film. You described a little some of the, just now, uh, strains that he sure. instantly noticed with who was surrounding the president. What was the relationship like early on as you became involved with uh, the Obama presidency? It was, uh, it was not good. I mean, it just wasn't. You know, the president just did not like him. It was just that simple. You see it on his face. And we go into some of the interactions, and, and we he did this in the film, the very first thing he says, he's interviewed by the president to be his secretary of state two days after the election. My father flies secretly to Chicago, goes in some back entrance and meets with the president-elect, and, and Obama says to him, Dick, it's good to meet you, and the very first thing he says is, I, I wish you'd called me Richard. Uh, my <laughs> wife once really prefers that. And I'm sorry, that's not what you do to the, with the president-elect, it's not what you say, and it's not how you Maybe later when your buddies, you can say, hey, can you just do me a favor and switch it over to Richard? But, but and the president-elect didn't like that. He was, you know, and he didn't, it was not a good step. The interview lasted 30 minutes. The president told people about that and I think always had that inherent awkwardness. That was just, I think, a, you know, a symptom of the larger issue, which was that, you know, generationally, all these things, they were disparate. And, and he had, my father had supported Hillary in the, primaries, but been very careful never to bash Obama like some of her surrogates did. He, he would extol Hillary, but not, and so he was uh, able to get this job, but it was not the right job for him. But even worse, Julian, it was, it was ill-conceived. You know, earlier I spoke about D General Doug Lute, who was the special assistant to Afghanistan and Pakistan. There was a special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan. You know, one in the White House, one in the State Department, that the two would have turf battles and clashes was inevitable. And, and so I, I think you know, the key to him getting done, getting Bosnia and Dayton achieved, was that Clinton liked him and believed in him. And I think the key to him not achieving it as much as he could have in Afghanistan, Pakistan, was the president didn't get him and didn't believe in him. And, and, and my father made things worse for himself. I mean, certainly the Richard Dick thing was the first, but there were other things where they were just out of step and, and 
you know, Joe Klein has a line in the film where he said, your father knew two ways, New York style elbows out or flattery, and neither of those work within the administration. And he told a story which we didn't use in the film where the president comes in to, he's just won the Nobel Peace Prize, just won it at like 7.30 in the morning, East Coast time. At 8 a.m., he has an AFPAC meeting. It's his first meeting on the schedule. And so the president walks in, and he stands up, and my father starts applauding because he's, and he looks around and realizes he's the only one applauding. And the president looks at him kind of dismissively. They all sit down, and the president says, last week we were talking about Kandahar, let's pick up there. And there was no, you know, high five on the Nobel. There was no, and, and my father was mad, and he didn't understand, you know, the sort of creativity of this administration. And I think being, you know, and he exacerbated by talking about Vietnam a lot, or that's how it was perceived. And, and from the Obama administration perspective, there, you know, the two were not related. My father saw them as certainly related. And, and so he thought the policy was flawed from the beginning, too. Yeah, he did. Well, I mean, and it, comes it, across. it was, and I think, you know, it, Obama's war, the book written by Bob Woodward, and we interview Bob in the film. Yeah, you know, he, he was, but, but he was going to be on board with whatever the policy was. If, if it was going to be a troop surge, he was going to help them articulate and sell that, but they just didn't want his voice in it. And, and there's a very painful scene to read about in Woodward's book where he says, uh, it was a situation room meeting, and everybody, you know, all the principals are there, and Woodward writes, and then Holbrook started to talk, and the note takers put down their pen and rested their hands because they knew the president had no more interest, or had, Holbrook had lost the president's interest, and so they did too. And, you know, it's sad to read that, but I think it's exactly what happened. And there were other times where the, my father would talk about you know, again, in the Situation Room, these very high-stakes meetings, and, and he'd say, you know, Mr. President, this is like when President Johnson and Clark Clifford are looking at whether to escalate the war in 1968, and, and the President of the United States would cut off my father and say, Richard, do people really talk like that? Mm -hmm. And can you imagine your boss, who happens to be the President, you know, and so, and, and it was, but he didn't get it, and he couldn't understand that he had to completely change his his tactics or his sensibility and, and, you know, and so I think that was right from the, from the get-go, it was a pretty bad match. Okay, I'm going to show one two-minute clip of Bob Woodward uh, sure. recounting their conversation in these tapes uh, with regard to Afghanistan. He wouldn't speak publicly about his private thoughts on U.S. policy for Afghanistan, but he was sharing them with a journalist. Bob Woodward was writing a book about the war and convinced my father to meet with him secretly. I knew your father for 30 years, and the deal was he would be candid. It's all on deep background. I can use it, but not say where it came from. Seeing he's no longer here, I've asked myself the question, what would he want me to do? And you being his son, I'm sure he would want you to have access to this material that explains what he was thinking and what was going on in those meetings in the White House. So, at the end, what was your recommendation to Hillary about troops and strategy? It would be crazy to get you to not have <laughs> your We're eating. wasn't optimistic. No, but he was a, a diplomat. Uh, you know, you, you keep pushing, and, uh, you know, eventually you may succeed. He wasn't spending Sunday mornings over here because he didn't believe in this, but he was also a realist. 
There is no magic formula in Afghanistan. There is no date and agreement in Afghanistan. It's going to be a long, difficult struggle. What went wrong here, and what's still wrong here, I think your dad got that very quickly. And really one of the central problems here that's bedeviled this giant project from the, from the start is Pakistan. We said it before, and let me say it again. Afghanistan cannot be stabilized unless Pakistan does its part. He's the first person I ever heard say that you couldn't think about Afghanistan without Pakistan. It was one problem. He called it AFPAC. What Richard Holbrook hoped to accomplish was a grand bargain. What he was thinking of was, let me figure out what would be best for the various parties in Afghanistan, and then see what Pakistan's concerns were about India, and then get all the major powers that were involved in the region to play a role. Pakistan's interests and American interests run in parallel. He was the first American diplomat to go into Pakistan and try to establish a normal relationship. Uh, can we talk a little bit more about Pakistan and yeah. um, that emphasis that he put on, on on the issue. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, look at those clips and uh, that whole, the, uh, it's a long, hard slog, there's no date, and he looks so tired there, he looks so worn out, and I just, and it was a tricky thing in the film because his vitality that he sees you have in Bosnia is gone. I think part of it, you know, traveling, making two trips to the region a month, basically, that's brutal, you know, and he was 69 years old, he was overweight, he, you know, and I think, but of course the stakes were so high and the job was so impossible and, and Pakistan really was problematic and, and remains so of course. And, and I, but I, I look at it and, and from talking to people who know a lot more about this than I do, his accomplishments for the Obama administration were bigger in, Afghan, in Pakistan than they were in Afghanistan. He was be able to build a real relationship and David Rode who you see there is just starting to say that, that he went in and said really let's talk about this. Let's, Let's build a relationship that's not purely transactional. And I think when he died, that went away. You know, so he dies in December of 2010. Sometime thereafter, a, a, a guy named, I think his name is Raymond Davis, a CIA guy ran over some people being chased and <clears throat> was arrested, and I forgot the details, but that was a problem. Then much bigger problem was two months later, uh, bin Laden was killed and obviously not a problem on one level or another problem was the Pakistani relationship and that further exacerbated and so my father would have been on a plane so quickly mm -hmm. to Pakistan and be talking to everybody and, and nobody from the administration was really doing that and and so that relationship he'd worked really assiduously to build over his year and a half in the job went out the window and 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 I think it still hasn't recovered from the people I talked to and 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 that's unfortunate on, on many levels. And, and Pakistan was, of course, also key to the grand bargain, as, as Ambassador Haqqani says in the film, this idea of you're gonna have Pakistan, but all the regional powers invested in this. And that would have included Iran and Russia and everybody working towards trying to end the war in Afghanistan. Well, what he did do, which was so interesting, I mean, he, he did something called the it's not, it's not the TPP, that's a different treaty, but it was the transit trade agreement, and that was between Pakistan and Afghanistan, and, and Hillary talked about that some with me, and she said, look, this was not a big deal, this was not a grand bargain in any way, but my father's point was that it was a deal, mm -hmm. and it was a smaller deal, which what other deals could be built on. It was relationships that other relationships could be built on, and it was a starting point, and to him, nobody else cared about the transit trade agreement but him, and that was really important to him, and the other part he cared about and this was his, to me, his signature achievement in that job was <clears throat> in the August of 2010, there's this massive floods through the country, through Swat Valley, in a region that was bigger than Italy. That's how much had been flooded. And he was there with USI, USAID, and he was there with relief. And he, he and his team, you know, this is an, a diplomat, an ambassador, who's showing up with health, you know, with tents, with supplies to these regions that have been devastated that before the Pakistani government in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And to him, that was sort of, that was also being a diplomat. And it's not a traditional notion of a diplomat, but that was to him very much what he could be doing. And, and so his efficacy in Pakistan 
which was limited, still outweighed what he was able to achieve in Afghanistan. I'm going to ask a question, but uh, then I want to turn it to you. So if you have a question, please go uh, walk up to one of the mics, and then I can call on you. I guess my final question is, obviously, a big part of the movie is to capture the life and career of your father, um, who was so significant. But I assume you also want to say more about uh, diplomacy, about foreign <laughs> relations that loom so large. What do you want people to get from the film? Well, look, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, one of the reasons I made this film was I felt he had something more to say. I felt, you know, he dies in December 2010 before Arab Spring, all that. But I felt he still, his wisdom and his vision of the world is relevant today. And so I really made it partly for that. I also like to say I made it so my children could understand who he was better. But it was really to, you know, the main thing to me was to inspire a generation of diplomats. And the final credit in the film says dedicated to the next generation of diplomats. And, and that's the thing that's been really great for me going to universities, but screenings everywhere. To have a film on HBO that makes diplomacy exciting. We were talking about that early, that the, there's an action movie right. feel to this. And, and to be able to tell his story, and for me to be able to tell his story as his son makes it more accessible. But I see it time and again, and I hope Everybody in the, the audience, of course, has inspired it, but I particularly want the people who might have been born, say, at the same time that Yugoslavia was ceasing to exist, you know, the people who are trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, to be able to look at this film and say, that guy was cool, you know, what it, I want to do some of that, and, and have that impact. And, and it's, it's pretty facile, that interpretation, but it's true, you know, diplomacy matters, and it matters today more than ever, you know, diplomacy backed by force. And I, you know, when I come, you know, in obviously not here on Princeton's campus, but if I walked into classrooms in many places across the country and said to the, said to, you know, the, the students, tell me what a soldier does, all the hands would go up. Tell me what a diplomat does, almost all the hands would go down. And, and I think it's more important than ever. And so to be able to have that understanding of this craft, and it is its own kind of craft, and it takes a, kind of strange bird to want to go be a diplomat, but that's the kind of bird we need now more than ever. And I think, you know, as, as everything becomes sharper and more pointed, we need people who can negotiate, can talk our way into peace. So that's what I really hope, you know, the, the commentary on the world is his and, and you know, and this question of, of America's role in, in all of this, but. Okay. Um, questions, come on up if you want to. Ask into the mic. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm Hi. a master's student in Korea public relations. So right on. Incidentally, I'll actually be in Sarajevo this summer at the embassy. Oh, really? Cool. Uh, interning. So it was really exciting to watch the documentary. I really yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah, and the embassy is in the middle of a, it's a great location. It'll be an exciting place. So my question is, um, have you gotten any kind of response or, or pushback from anybody uh, within the Obama administration or who was there at the time uh, the way that it's sort of portrayed, you know, in terms of the military basically dominating foreign policy? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we, for the record, we also, we asked uh, both President Obama and Vice President Biden for interviews, and they were, neither of them were able to do it, which I understood. And, you know, we haven't gotten, it, it sort of surprised me. I was expecting at some point to get pushback because the film got a lot of attention. The New York Times did three different articles on it. You know, I was all over the place on press stuff, and and they didn't come back out. That, that being said, Samantha Power, who's in the film, and is the sitting ambassador of the UN, you know, I, I was really worried what she was going to think about. And Samantha's tough as hell, and, and, you know, all this, and I just was really nervous about her reaction to the film, and I hadn't heard from her. I was like, Samantha, you see it? We sent you a DVD, you see it? And... And then the night it aired on HBO, I got a note from her talking about how beautiful it was. And, and she understood, I think, you know, the criticism in there of the Obama administration has been well reported. And, and I think it stands on its own. So we haven't gotten pushback. Interestingly enough, Doug Lute, who is the special assistant uh, that I've spoken about a couple of times, he's the current ambassador to NATO. And he, you know, he's in the film. And it's not that he doesn't come off well, but he doesn't really come off well in the film. I've been told by people who watch it, and they, and he wants to host a screening in Brussels, which is great. You know, I haven't heard from Dom Donnellan, who's a controversial figure within the film. 
Uh, but the general consensus, from what I can gather, is people are moved by it, and, and I think the story does hold up. But I have somebody who saw an early cut said to me, they're like, wow, you really take on the administration? I said, yeah. He said, I hope your taxes are in order. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for those of us who remember Vietnam quite personally. Could you share with us, please, from what were the lessons that your father derived from Vietnam? And as has been mentioned several times in the, in the film clips, how did they impact his career and, and the positions that he took of importance? Sure. So, you know, he really... I think the big thing, there's a, there's a speech that we use early in the film that's really interesting for the, especially the students who are doing deep dives into this. It's, a, it's on the State Department's website. It's him and Kissinger and some other people talking about Vietnam. And it's the Vietnam historian's lecture or something. And he worked really hard at it. And he, he gives this speech, says, what have we learned? What did, we, what did it all mean, he says? What did it all mean? And he said, well, and he has this nice line. He said this. As they say, this reflects my views, not the American government's on this. But what his big framing point is that when you send men and women overseas, you have to be really clear about the objectives. And that was clearly didn't, that clearly did not happen in Vietnam. My theory is he's ostensibly speaking about Vietnam in this speech. But what he's really talking about, and this is in the fall of 2010, is Afghanistan. And, and to me, that's his, what he's saying is that we're not clear about our objectives, and we're not. And that, that's the part that, to me, of all this is the most frustrating, is I look here in February of 2016, and the recent Washington Post headlines are, troops expected to leave Afghanistan 2017, but looks like we'll stay for decades. And here's another one, Afghanistan, worse than it seems. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, you know, here's another one. Russia ending our cooperation with the United States and Afghanistan. I didn't even know we were cooperating with them. <laughs> um, but where that's ending, and, and I think that's the thing that, that as just really an American frustrates me the most. I'm not saying my father could have extricated us uh, from Afghanistan, but he was never given the chance to do that. For really, to me, in the end, one major reason was that the president didn't like him. The president's entitled to like or not like whoever he wants to like. He's the president but that he kept him in this job, that he marginalized him and undercut him, that drives me crazy because, you know, and again, as an American, certainly as his son, but as an American, say, okay, if you can bring this guy in, let him do his job. And they just didn't do that. And it'd be one thing if we were looking at it and saying, okay, high fives, mission accomplished. But here we are in, you know, in a quagmire. And, and uh, you know, in 2010, 2010, yeah, Obama, I mean, Woodward releases the book Obama's War. Arguably premature to call Afghanistan at that point Obama's War. Bush had had seven years to do that and done nothing, but it's Obama's War now for sure, and, and it's a mess. And, and that, to me, really frustrates me. And, and you know, smarter people than me in this room, if anybody can articulate American policy in Afghanistan, I'd love to hear it. And, and that, to me, was... I think a big takeaway from Vietnam. In Bosnia, it's end the killing. End it. It's got to stop. And he was right. And we'll, we'll make, you know, maybe some diplomatic deals, a treaty that won't make everybody happy, but we will stop the killing, and that's what's happened. And as he'd be the first to say about Dayton, it was a very imperfect peace and one that needs to be updated, but it achieved that goal, and that was clear. And, and that's what I think he took away from Vietnam, was to find those objectives and work towards them. And that didn't happen in Afghanistan. There was another part. I hope I got that. There was another part. Great. The images that you have from uh, Bosnia are just horrendous. I've, I haven't seen as much kind of visual imagery from that uh, war. And, and that was driving. I mean, if you think about it, the, you know, this was concentration camp. Right. And here it was, it was never again, never again in Europe is this going to happen. And, and, you know, there were a lot of, un, you know, Bob Dole was a hero in Bosnia. Um, and Elie Wiesel, you know, we, who we interviewed, and Elie Wiesel did this amazing thing to Clinton at the Holocaust Museum, the dedication of the Holocaust Museum, talking about the Holocaust. Clinton's there as the sitting, as president. He looks over to President Clinton and says, Mr. President, there's another Holocaust going on in Europe right now, and you have, you have to do more. Clinton was furious. He'd been shamed by Elie Wiesel 
on stage publicly, but that's what Nobel laureates can do if you elite yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here we Yes, uh, your father did excellent diplomacy in, in Bosnia and Serbia during the Clinton administration and in, in some ways put an end to what was becoming a genocide. Later in the same administration, there was the genocide in Rwanda. Did your father ever express any interest to go there? And um, can you expand upon that, please? Sure. Um, he, he didn't, as far as I know. I know he felt that intervention in Rwanda should have been happened. And, and from what I understand, Clinton has said his two biggest regrets are Rwanda, and he felt he didn't do enough about AIDS. Two pretty big things, but, you know, and Rwanda, <coughs> It wouldn't have taken much. And it was, it was interesting. I hope I get the story right. But I was in Hong Kong showing the film to this Asia Society group. And this guy came up to me afterwards and said, I just want to talk to you. And he was a, now he's in the Council on Foreign Relations, but he'd been in the military. And he said he was on a, basically a gunship, a big helicopter with a bunch of other soldiers headed for Kigali. Is that right? Is that the, the head of the capital of Rwanda? But he's headed to go, and they got called off. And he said that he's always wondered, you know, that he always felt if he had been, this was before it all unraveled, and, and that he felt if American power had landed in Rwanda with a couple of gunships and a bunch of Marines coming off, would that have prevented that genocide? And, and he never, you know, it was, it was a fascinating what if scenario. And, and I know, you know, my father felt very much so that that was a lesson to, to do more. And, and in some cases, he was accused of being hawkish, but he knew that you know American firepower was was a you know an arrow, so to speak, in his diplomatic quiver. And that scene, the 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 B fifty two in Dayton, Ohio, at the museum, and that was a very conscious thing to say. Look, we can do this, and and you know the Serbs who were so intimidating, who were causing such chaos, folded pretty quickly once we started. NATO started dropping some bombs. In fact, the, we had another sound that we didn't use, but from that dinner, the defense minister was seated under a cruise missile. <laughs> and he said, he looked up, and he said, I think that's the bomb that hit my house. <laughs> yeah, and it was this thing that, you know, uh, Americans, and that was the other thing that my father felt, I think part of his philosophy from Vietnam was, the idea of America being the unique superpower. And, and, and he was a patriot, it's a word we don't use some, but he believed in America's role to lead and to lead honorably. He also knew the plenty of instances where we didn't, like in Rwanda. Right. But he would have said, here we are uniquely suited. And, and you know, to go back to the theater thing just for quickly, was these tapes that he had, he, he talked about seeing South Pacific He's, he's, you know, just his own audio tapes. He had gone to see the final show of South Pacific, this, you know, classic musical at Lincoln Center, and talked about, and as he's telling the story of seeing it, it was the last performance, he starts to get emotional on the tape. And he was so moved by this production that a day later, he's, you know, audibly moved by what he had seen. It was a representation of American power, the height of it, and this, you know, doing the right thing in World War II and all of this, and to him the dissolution of that, of what he had seen in Vietnam and so on, had influenced right. him. You just asked about Rwanda. I kind of went around the world, and I'm sorry. But. Oh, that's yeah. great. I have a quick follow-up question. Sure, so if President Clinton stayed out of Rwanda, what did he assign your father to do during that period? You know, so Rwanda, what's the, did somebody know the exact date in Rwanda when that was going down? It's on 90, 90 what? Nine? Was it that late? No, it was earlier. Yeah. There we go. Somebody's looking up this young lady. She's got this. <laughs> um, so, you know, he was, he was, and the, the government. 94. Yeah, 94. 94. That makes sense. So, that, so what he was doing then was he was in Europe. And he was ambassador to Germany. Then he's moving on to the European desk. And the way it works is you're on the European desk and you shut the hell up about Africa. Mm. You know, just like Africa doesn't bug you about Europe. It's just sort of the way things are done in the State Department, unless you're at a higher level than he was. And, but he was specifically on, on Bosnia. But you know, he would have seen it all as all related and said, OK, you know, these are you know, just like you know, our inaction in Syria is related to Afghanistan, but also related, of course, to what's happening in Libya. And they all start connecting pretty quickly. 
Okay, thank you. Final question. Hey, man, you got are, your, are your kids going to be diplomats or filmmakers? <laughs> Which good, one? Good question. I think neither. I think my son will be a farmer. That makes sense. Um, I do think actually my middle daughter will be a filmmaker, and, and you know she's been. They've been around, and they were part of making the movie, and that was a really conscious thing in my efforts in making this film. You know, we are nine countries, and. My oldest daughter went to Afghanistan, Bosnia, and Kosovo with me. My middle daughter went to Vietnam. My son was like, I am so screwed on this. They took the, <laughs> he took the daughters to the, to the big places, but he got to do the Hillary Clinton interview, and that was exciting. And, and you know, what, what I, th I don't know, but what I do believe, and I think that's another thing of the film, is that they're going to want to do something with meaning. You know? And that's why I say to you as a young man, is do something that has meaning in your life meaning to you, but meaning to beyond. And, and that was my father's thing at age 16 in one of his journals, he wrote the word purpose and underlined it six times and believed in living a life of purpose. And that, I do feel that partly because of his example, partly because of their grandmother's example, and partly because of the world I've tried to raise them in is they're gonna be engaged and whether they're a farmer, a diplomat, or a filmmaker, or none of the above, that they'll have, live a life that has purpose. Maybe not on line six times, but how about three? Yeah. Sure. Yes, speech. sir. No problem. Okay. Hey, all good. Yeah, how would he have handled the chaos of the current Middle East? I, I think, uh, you know, I, I really don't know. And, and, you know, like I said, he died six weeks before Tunisia starts the Arab Spring. And it's a remade world in a way, or an unmade world, however you want to look at it. But he, I, I think he would have been encouraged actually by some of the efforts of the Obama administration in this second term. And you know, he would have looked at it through a prism of what can America do. And I think he would have been impressed with Secretary Kerry's effort on Iran. Not to mention Burma um, and, uh, or Myanmar and Cuba. But he really felt, you know, and it's just guessing, but also talking to people around him, that he would have looked at the Iran deal as a real accomplishment of diplomacy. And there are one, not enough of those. Two, to see diplomacy like that all the way through, where again, like Dayton, you have a high wire act of falling off and not working. You know, everybody, the world's watching, and he would have respected the hell out of Secretary Kerry and President Obama for going for it with an uncertain knowledge. He also would have liked that here you had a deal that involved not only Iran and the United States, but Russia, China, all these actors who need to do some positive things together. I think he would have disagreed strongly with holding the talks in Vienna. He would have said, what's the date in Ohio equivalent of Vienna? <laughs> and let's move it there so we can isolate these people. But, but he, he would have been impressed with that. You know, I, I don't know what his vision was. My, my brother always cautions me not to transpose what I think is happening, which is generally pretty facile and you know, un, you know, kind of basic to what he would have. And so I try not and guess too much, but, but I do have a better sense of looking at Iran and specifically. Sure. We're actually just about out of time. Um, so uh, let me just say uh, it's a really wonderful, wonderful movie. Um, I see a lot of documentaries and this one really stuck and I think it works on multiple levels, and, and you haven't talked as much about just the personal aspect of making it, and the way you weave it through uh, the film is really quite phenomenal. Well, thank you. I, you know, that was a real thing, was to say, okay, this is my story of his life, and that was the biggest challenge as filmmaker was getting my voice right, and, and I think one of the things I often talk about is, is I never had the opportunity to interview my father, so I particularly say to some of the younger folk in the room, and anybody whose parents are alive, please interview them. Sit down with your phone, sit down. Well, I don't know what this strange contraption is in front of me, but uh, you know, get, get them on tape and just have that. You don't need to make a movie about them. You just need to say, okay, wait, let's get these stories and have them. And, and I think they're in, enormously valuable, whether, he's, whether your parents are, whatever they do, and, and, and you know, it, it, is, it is important. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. That was terrific. My pleasure, Jane. Thank you.